gosh, I think I broke my tailbone. And then after that, I want you guys to know, I was thinking, maybe I can go to the emergency room after I preach tonight. And so I was very concerned about this. You guys are very important. I wanted to get here tonight um, to preach. And so I am still in pain, but I don't think it's broken. Um, So moral of the story, um, if you want to kill your campus minister, well, first, don't kill your campus minister. (laughs) Um, But second, if you really want to, put the chin-up bar over like a cliff or something, because (laughs) I'll still take the bait. I'll still take the bait every time. Um, But that was a decision that impacted me, still impacting me. Um, And and tonight we're going to talk a little bit about decisions and a little bit more um, weighty decisions than just the construction of our tailbones. Um, And so if you guys want to flip in your Bibles to John chapter 7... Uh, we're going to read the whole chapter. Um, it's, it's a big chapter, but we're going we're gonna to read through, and then we're going to go back and kind of dissect it. And so if you guys are in your U version tonight as well, um, it, it's on there. And then any verses that I'll be referencing as well um, will be in the U version. But we'll start with chapter 7, verse 1. It says, After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews... Uh, Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand, so his brother said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples may also see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast, I am not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come." After saying this, he remained in Galilee, but after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but in private. The Jews were looking for him at the feast, saying, where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people. While some said, he is a good man, others said, no, he is leading people astray. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly about him. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up to the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, how is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but it is his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent is true. And in him there is no falsehood. Has not Moses given you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answers, You have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? And Jesus answered them, I did one work, and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers, and that you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. And if on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, is not this the man whom they seek to kill? And here he is speaking openly, and they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? But we know where this man comes from, and when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, you know me and you know where I come from, but I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true, and him you do not know. I know him, for I came from him, and he sent me. So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come, yet many of the people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him, and the chief priests and Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. And then Jesus said, I will be with you a little longer, and then I am going to him who sent me. You will seek me, and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying, you will seek me, and you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? On the last day of the feast, the great The great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. When they heard these words, some of the people said, This really is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David? And was Bethlehem, the village where David was. So there was a division among the people over him, and some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, why did you not bring him? The officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered them, have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities of the Pharisees believed in him? 
But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before and who was one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? And they replied, Are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. All right, so that's our chapter for tonight. And the setting is the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles. And uh, what this was, was it was a, a yearly celebration that, that the Jews um, had, and, and they would go up to, to Jerusalem, their holy city, and they would camp outside of it, and they would, they would live in like tents or kind of homemade shelters, and it was to remind them of the, their time in the wilderness. It was to remind them of their time that, that God had brought them out of Egypt and how God had provided for them even when they were without a home. And so um, it was reminding them of God's salvation um, from Egypt, and um, but when we go through this text, the thing that's the most prominent in this text is basically what are people saying about Jesus? What, what, what do people say that Jesus is? Who do they claim that he is? And that, that's kind of the, the theme that we're seeing here. It's all these little um, comments about Jesus, and it's kind of a, a smattering of, of different interactions. And so what I want to do is I want to go through first, and I want to just highlight all of the things that people say about Jesus. And so when we look first, and and you can follow along, I'm just going to kind of reference the verses as we go through. Um, But when we look at verses 1 through 8, we see um, that Jesus has an interaction with his brothers. And so his own brothers, we see, do not believe him. And uh, in between Nicholas's sermon um, and and John chapter 5 and now, um, quite a few things have happened with Jesus. Um, Jesus has uh, done the feeding of the 5,000. He's walked on water. Um, he referred to himself in a previous discourse right before this as the Son of Man multiple times, um, which is a clear reference back to Daniel chapter 7, um, where it says that the Son of Man is riding on the clouds, and it, and it equates the Son of Man with God. And so it's very clear what Jesus is, is claiming here. Um, and then Jesus realizes uh, shortly after that that these people that are following him, it's more than just the disciples, and, and Jesus realizes that some of them don't believe, and, and some of them are kind of murmuring, and they're saying, you know, these are some hard teachings. How can we, how can we accept this? And, and so Jesus says, well, are you offended by this? Are you offended by what I'm saying? What if you were to see me ascend back to where I came from? And they're like, no, we can't handle this. And so some of them walk away, but then there's, there's still some that are following him. And so there's, there's kind of this division already. And then we get to our story, and we see in the beginning here that his own brothers don't believe him, right? The first verse is that shows that, that Jesus can't just go about wherever he wants because the Jews are, are trying to kill him. And the brothers are like, you know, hey, just come on up here. You know, you can't just do this in secret. You know, they're kind of challenging him to to. to to do uh, his, his things openly, but, but Jesus has a mission to accomplish, and his primary mission is uh, dying on the cross for our sins, providing the sacrifice for the re- redemption of our sins and the redemption of those who believe, um, but he still has other things that he has to accomplish, so he can't just go up and, and get arrested right away and, and taken to the cross right away at, at this point in his ministry, so he's, he's kind of acting in secret a little bit. And then in verse 11, we go down and we see that everybody's talking and muttering about Jesus. They're like, they're like where is he? They're, they're muttering amongst themselves. Um, he's, he's the talk of the town. They're like, yeah, we, we saw, you know, his brothers, they came and he's not with his family. Like, where is he at? Why is Jesus late to the feast? What's going on here? Um, and it's kind of interesting because back then and, and really just before technology gave us everything instantly, um, there were still like wildly famous people. Um, but there weren't as many famous people. Now we have like thousands and thousands of famous people, right? We've got famous athletes, famous like actors and actresses, uh, famous politicians, famous everything. I mean, there's just th- thousands of, of famous people. Um, and I remember reading this story about uh, Charles Lindbergh. Um, anybody, you guys know who that is? All of you aerospace engineers should, should know. He was the first one to fly across the Atlantic, right? Um, 1927, he was 25 years old, um, and he became one of the most famous men on earth. Um, and then adding to that, he married a, a famous uh, writer named Anne Morrow, and uh, that kind of doubled his fame in a way. And then very tragically, um, there were people that, that kind of, since he was on the map and she was on the map, that, that knew that they could exploit this. And um, very tragically, somebody ended up kidnapping um, their, their child, and they never, they never got their child back. Um, but during this time, it was like the height of their fame because it was all the good things and then this bad, this tragedy that happened in their lives. And um, people were saying at this point that they were the most famous couple in the entire world. Um, and that's without technology, but um, I remember reading about this, and it was talking about how they couldn't go anywhere in public. I mean, people would just mob them. 
And that's kind of like what was happening with Jesus. I mean, they didn't have technology. They couldn't pull up his Wikipedia page. They couldn't, uh, you know, jump on the news and be like, oh, what did Jesus say today? Um, so people just, when they saw Jesus, I mean, they just crowded and they just came from everywhere around him. And we see that there's, the people are, are divided, but um, Jesus' kind of fame is, is, is increasing and increasing, both among people who believe him and believe that he's Messiah, and also people who don't believe him. And so he, this is kind of where he's at right now. Then in verse 12, we see the people are saying, oh, he's a good man. And then other people are saying, no, he, he's leading people astray. And so there's division here. And then in 14 and 15, people are saying, wow, how, how can he teach like this? He's a man from Galilee. Like, well, he doesn't have any learning. He doesn't have any, any uh, formal uh, rabbinic training. You know, they're looking at him. They're like, you know, you're a carpenter, right? I actually bought, you know, a, a, a set of chairs from you a couple years ago. Like, you're a carpenter. How can you teach like this? And then Jesus says, you know, it's not my teaching. It's, it's teaching from God, the one who sent me. And then um, in, in verse 20, we see that people say, you have a demon. And they're like, who's trying to kill you? And then later on in verse 25, there's kind of uh, recognition and muttering about how, how people want to kill Jesus. And they're like, you know, they're talking about this. And they're like, yeah, some people want to kill him. Some people don't want to kill him. Um, and then in verse 26, uh, the people wonder if the authorities know that he is the Christ. And so they're looking at Jesus and they're like, you know, he's saying all these things, but could it be true that the authorities know that he's Jesus? Because the reason they're asking this is because Jesus is claiming to be God. And so the Jews, they know that either the authorities know that what he's saying is true and that's why they're not arresting him, or, you know, he should be arrested. And so they're like watching this all play out and they're like, why aren't the authorities arresting Jesus? Um, you know how we're always kind of wondering what the government knows that we don't, right? I mean, do we have any conspiracy theorists in here, right? Maybe. And nobody wants to say that they are. Oh, Scott's a big conspiracy theorist. Don't let him talk. Don't let him talk to you about conspiracy theories. It'll take forever. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so we have these conspiracy theories, right? And some are crazier than others, but like Bigfoot, you know, what happened in 9-11, Area 53, secret government conspiracies, right? Well, these are... These are all things that people love to maybe speculate about, right? And now you're like, whoa, I didn't know there actually was Bigfoot. I'm going to have to look into that. Um, but this is kind of the original conspiracy theory. And, and, and we recognize there's things that people in power know that we don't, right? And so that's what the people are, they're like, do they know something about Jesus that we don't? What do the authorities, what do the people in power, what are they saying about Jesus? What do they know um, that we don't? And then in verse 27, the people claim to know where Jesus comes from and that he can't be the Christ because of this. They're like, hey, uh, you know, the Christ isn't going to come from Galilee. And basically what they're saying is like, um, hey, nobody good can come out of the inner city or nobody good can come out of like Hicksville, Missouri. It, there's, there's like some cultural um, prejudice here because Galilee was kind of known as like I don't know, the rednecks of the day. Like, that's just kind of what they were. They're uneducated people, right? And so uh, there's some cultural prejudice here. Um, and then in verse 31, uh, we see that some people believed a little bit, but still wondered um, if Jesus would, have, would do more than, than what he had done. So basically, like, if um, they're wondering, they're like, okay, yeah, we're seeing what he's doing, and, like, it seems to make sense, but... Will the true Christ, when, or when the Messiah comes, will he do more than what Jesus is doing now? So there's, they're kind of on the edge of believing a little bit. Um, and then verse 32 and 30 through 36, it's like really funny if you read it. So the authorities come to Jesus. They're like, all right, we've had enough. You know, Jesus is kind of interrupting our, um, interrupting our feast, and he's teaching these things. So the authorities come to arrest him, and Jesus is like, whoa, 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 hold on. Um, I'm only going to be with you for a little while longer. And then I'm going to go away, and where I go, you won't be able to find me. And they're like, what? We're the police. Like, we're going to find you. Like, you're so famous, you can't even hide in your own city. Like, we're going to find you, Jesus. And he's like, no, 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 no. I'm going back to where I came from. You, you can't follow me there. And, of course, Jesus is saying, when I'm done with my work here, when I'm done dying on the cross and, and, and resurrecting, I'm going back to heaven where I came from. But the people, they don't understand this. So they're like, what, what is he saying? He's saying he can hide from us? This doesn't make sense. Um, and then in verses 40 and 41, we see that the people say, this really is the prophet. And then others say, this is the Christ. And the reason there's kind of a division here between these two things is that at this time, um, you know, when we look back at the Old Testament, we, we, we know what the, uh, the picture looks like. 
We know what the puzzle, uh, the puzzle looks like completed. Um, but at this time, they, they had all of these references in the Old Testament to a coming Messiah or a coming prophet. And of course, Jesus was both of those things, but they didn't know that yet. And so they're, they're looking at all of these puzzle pieces, and they haven't fit them all together. So um, they weren't sure if this was um, actually the Messiah or just another prophet. or They weren't sure exactly. And then in 44, of course, they want to arrest him, but nobody, nobody, ever, nobody did anything. And if you guys ever wonder why Jesus got arrested at night um, by a cover of darkness, it's because the authorities were scared of the people. They were scared. They knew that the people would protest. And so if you ever wonder why Jesus was arrested at night, put through a speedy trial that was rigged in, in their favor and just like shipped off to the cross, I mean, in the matter of, 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 of less than a day. It was like all in that night. And so the reason they did that was because they had to do it by cover of night. Um, because they were afraid of the people. And then finally, we kind of end at, in verse 52, um, where, where the, the Pharisees say, are you from Galilee too? And then they say, search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. Um, now, there actually were a couple prophets that came from Galilee, and so either they didn't know that, or they're just like, their cultural prejudice is coming through. Not sure, but um, again, it's kind of like this, like, hey, now this isn't possible. Um, and so, this passage, there's, there's so much controversy and drama surrounding this, this week. And remember, all of these things are happening throughout the course of eight days during the Feast of Booths. And, and there's so much controversy happening, I can't help but wonder, like, like, was anybody even focused on the feast, right? I don't think anybody was even focused on why they were there. They were just like wondering and waiting, like, when's Jesus going to say the next thing? And they're like looking at the authorities, like watching Jesus, and Jesus is watching them, watching the authorities, and they're just like waiting, like what's gonna go down here? And there's all these questions and speculations and oppositions to Jesus in this chapter, and I can't help but, but think that John is begging us to ask the same questions. Who is Jesus, right? Why did John put this in the Bible? Who is Jesus? And so we see the same type of interaction, actually, in Matthew chapter 16. It's on a little bit more of an intimate level with Jesus and just his disciples. But he says, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. My friends, Jesus doesn't care what this group of people are saying he doesn't care what your friend says about him. He doesn't care about what the world says about him or the religious elite. What Jesus cares about is what you say about him and what you say about him and what you say about him. He cares about what you say as an individual about who he is. And you see, when I first read through this chapter, I thought to myself, man, this, this chapter, it seems to lack structure. It's just kind of a conglomeration of like, all of these micro interactions over the course of the week. And, and my main thought was, why did John put this chapter in the Bible? Um, when you guys, how many of you guys like writing papers? None of you. One, two, three. Okay. So when you're writing a paper, though, God forbid that you do that in engineering school. school. Um, but when you're writing a paper, or maybe some of you are, are, are uh, writing a thesis or preparing to write a thesis, you have a, you have a main point, right? Or a question that you need to answer or an assertion to make. Um, and we all know how to fluff up a paper, right? High school kind of teaches us that really good. <clears throat> but the higher you go in education, the less you can use that fluff, right? And the less they care about that fluff. And at a certain point in education, you get to a point where length doesn't really matter. The only length that matters is how little can you use, how little space and words can you use to convey the topic correctly or to, to make this assertion, right? And so... Um, and so when we go to the very last verse in the book of John, um, it's interesting. It says, John 21, 25, it says, Now there were many other things that Jesus did, were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Now, I, I wish that we had more of the interactions of Jesus. I mean, in, in just what we have, there's some pretty crazy stuff. Um, there's some weird interactions. Um, there's some weird things sometimes that Jesus says, some things that are hard to understand. And, and obviously, you know, sometimes it was just this story over this story or this story wasn't necessary. And so I, I wish we had more, but um, obviously we know there's more that Jesus did that, that is not written. Um, but then we also need to look at what was John's thesis statement? Why, what was his purpose in writing this? And we've referenced this a couple times, but John chapter 20, 30 through 31 it says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, 
But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. And so John's purpose in writing this book was so that we could read these stories about Jesus, including the things that other people are saying about him, and we could know and believe that Jesus is who he says he is, that we could believe that Jesus is God, that he is the redeemer of mankind, and that we could have salvation in his name. And it's no coincidence that the climactic ending to the book of John is Thomas's statement. We talked about this. What did Thomas say? I'm going to yell it out. said, my Lord and my God, right? It was that de declarative statement by Thomas. He said, my Lord and my God. And so we read all these things about what people said about Jesus, and, and John is, is obviously writing from a certain perspective, but he, he, he has all these things here, but then he ends the book with a statement about Jesus, my Lord and my God. And so John has his mission of writing the book, and there's many things that he could have written but didn't. Um, we also believe that the Holy Spirit um, was active in, his writing of, in the writing of the New Testament. And so we believe that the Holy Spirit, who is God, um, was inspired, or inspired John in his writing to write no more or no less than what was needed. No more or no less than what God wanted to be communicated in this gospel. And so why did John include chapter 7 in his gospel? Well, let's go back to the highlights of the chapter. Jesus does some teaching. People are murmuring and speculating about him. The officials attempt to arrest him, and there are those that want to kill him. I think that John, at this point in the book, and remember, you, you know, a lot of us have read the whole thing, right? So we know how it ends, but picture yourself reading this for the first time. You're reading these things that Jesus is doing and saying, and at this point in the book, I think John wants to make it clear that who we say Jesus is, what we say about Jesus, is a matter of life and death. I mean this quite literally. Who we say Jesus is is a matter of life and death. In verse 38, if you go back to the passage, um, Jesus says, He who believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And then the people want to kill him. Now, this statement is a lot more scandalous than it may appear. So the Feast of Booths, a little more background into this, one of the, the main like, pr thing that they would do is they would um, they would all of the people would gather around and one of the priests would draw some water out in a bucket. And then they would all um, kind of go through Jerusalem all the way through up to the very top, up to the temple. And as they were walking through, they would like be singing praise songs and quoting different passages of scripture. And then they would get to the top and they'd sing some more songs and quote some more scripture. And the, the priest would dump the water out on uh, the altar. And the altar was made of rock. And so it was symbolic of the fact that, that God had provided for them in the wilderness. Remember when Moses struck the rock? Um, and of course, he wasn't supposed to strike the rock, but it was God that provided the water, right? And in the wilderness, in the desert, water is life. And so it was symbolic of remembering that God had provided life to them. And so they did this once each day. And then on the final day, on the eighth day, they would do it seven times in a row, and so this was a long event. I mean, back down to the edge of the city, get the water, and then come back through and do it all over again. And I kind of like to imagine that there's, you, you know how when you, sometimes you have something that's like really big or important that you have to do in, in front of a lot of people, and, and you're kind of getting hyped up for it, and you're nervous, and maybe your family comes to support you. Maybe you're like giving a presentation, or you're speaking somewhere. You're just doing something that's big, right, as a part of an organization, um, well, I like to think that there's, you know, that maybe this, this, uh, there's this one priest that, that wanted to, or that got to do this, and it was like his turn, right? And it was the first time he was going to, you know, dump the water at the end on the very last time. And, and so he's, he's nervous, and he's prepared, and he's got, you know, his family's coming. They're here for the, the feast, and, and he gets the water, and he's walking with it, and he's walking through the city, and he's passing by people, and his friends are kind of giving them that wink, and they're, you know, they're singing, and they're like, hey, man. Good job, good job, keep going, you're doing a good job, right? And they're singing and they're quoting their verses. And he walks back to his parents and his parents are like kind of whispering over to the other people. Yeah, we're, we're really proud of what Jethro's doing, you know, his, his ministry at the temple. He's just doing such a great job. Praise God. And they go back to singing. So it's like this important moment, right? And so he gets up to the top and he has the water and they finish the last song and they quote the last verse and he dumps it over the water, which, or over the, the, the altar, which is symbolic of God's life-giving attribute to them in the wilderness. And then Jesus stands up, and in the silence, Jesus stands up and says, 
He who believes in me will have rivers of living water in his heart. And it's silent. Stands up in front of everybody and says, he who believes in me will have living waters in his heart. Jesus is equating himself in front of everyone. I mean, he's ruining this ceremony. But he's equating himself with God who gives life. And he's saying, if you believe in me, I will give you life. Of course, he says he's referring to the Spirit, and so what Jesus is saying is it's pouring out of you. When we have the Holy Spirit, we have the knowledge of life through Jesus, and then when we talk to other people about Jesus, we give them life too. And so this statement is is, is crazy that Jesus does this at this moment. Jesus is promising life, and the authorities want to kill him. And then Nicodemus, one of their own, one of the Pharisees, he literally just stands up, and, you know, they're talking about how they're going to kill him. And Nicodemus stands up, and he's like, well, hey, guys, what about, like, don't you think that, you know, our law requires that we, like, give him a fair trial before we just pronounce him guilty, right? And they're like, shut up, Nicodemus. Are you serious? Like, go back to Galilee, you unlearned, you know, hick. Like, they're angry at him. It's like one of those moments where everybody's fired up about something and that one person kind of steps in like, well, I don't know, guys. And you're just like, shut up. No, we want to kill him. (laughs) And so the tension is mounting here. Jesus was and still is the most controversial man to ever walk this earth. Jesus, uh, Jesus, uh, what we say about Jesus is a matter of life and death. Um, All except for one of Jesus' apostles were killed for what they said about Jesus. And there's been a lot of martyrs throughout history, but it it hasn't stopped yet. I mean, in the last 10 years, it's estimated that 900,000 Christians have been murdered for who they say Jesus is. And I'm not saying that this is a bad thing, but in our culture, we're we're kind of obsessed with persecuted uh, uh, minority groups in our culture. And a lot of good things have come about through more cultural awareness, right? But do we care about our brothers and sisters in Christ who have who die, who who get killed, who get murdered for who they say that Jesus is. And I bring this up not to shame us, but I bring this up to show the gravity of this question, the gravity of the seriousness of what we say about Jesus. Jesus knew that this would be the case in John chapter 15. He says, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And obviously, what we say about Jesus can be a matter of physical life and death, and there have been different points in history that, where it, it very much has been in different cultures and different areas of the world, and even still today, but even more than that, who we say Jesus is is a matter of spiritual life and death. One of my favorite passages in the Bible is in the book of Jude, and um, in, in, the, in the book of Jude, he, he talks about um, when people are wandering away from the faith, straying away from what Jesus has taught us, it says, save them by snatching them out of the fire. And so what Jude is equating here is he's saying, when we save somebody who's walking away from the faith, we're literally saving them from hell. And we don't really like to talk about hell, but this is what's at stake here. What we say about Jesus is a matter of life and death. And are we living like that? For those of us who are believers, are we living like this is the knowledge that we have? Who do you say Jesus is? A lot of questions in John that, 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 that John pulls up in John chapter 7. A lot of statements about Jesus, a lot of speculation about Jesus. Who do you say that he is? This is the most important question that you could ever ask yourself. It is the crux of the Christian faith. You know, when we talk about the validity of Christianity or the validity of the, of the Bible, there's a lot of different things that people could bring up or a lot of different things to, to, to uh, talk about or questions to wrestle with. But when we talk about Jesus, that's the one thing that truly, truly matters. He's the crux of our human faith, or of our Christian faith. And so as, as people, this is the most important question that we can answer. Who is Jesus? Who did he say he was? There's a lot of other religions that have similarities with, with Christianity, and, and, and that's awesome. We can talk about those, and, and, and sometimes it's kind of cool to talk to people from other uh, uh, places and, and walks of life and whatnot. But if you notice, the one thing that every other religion will disagree with Christianity on relates to Jesus. And I believe that it's because that's the most crucial thing that could be different. 
It's the one thing that we need to make a decision on. In John chapter 14, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. So Jesus is saying a couple things here, but one, he's saying, if you know me, you know God. He's saying, you get to God through me. The other thing that he's saying is he's claiming exclusivity. Jesus is saying that there's no other way to God except through him. There's no salvation outside of him, no redemption outside of him, no knowledge of God outside of him and who he is. Jesus makes it very clear in our passage tonight as well, and uh, we'll read these in verse 16 through 18. Back in chapter 7, it says, So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but is his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. Then in verses 29, or 28 and 29, it says, so Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, you know me and you know where I come from, but I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true and him you do not know. I know him for I come from him and he sent me. Jesus is saying, if you know me, you know God. If you know me, you know God. No other prophet claimed these things. No other man who isn't crazy claims to be God. Jesus is making it clear that if you know him, you know God. And there are many people searching for God. But Jesus is saying, if you want to get to God, it's through me. C.S. Lewis said in his book, Mere Christianity, it's kind of a long quote here, but it says, I'm trying here to prevent someone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg. I guess that's a little British humor there. Poached egg? I don't know. Or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. You guys are logical people studying here at s and math and science. You got to be logical, right? Um, but you guys understand, if I tell you guys that I'm God, if I tell you I'm God, this is like one of two possibilities, right? I either am telling the truth or I'm a liar. And if I'm a liar, then I'm probably evil and manipulative and all these other things too, right? That's essentially what C.S. Lewis is saying here about Jesus. Jesus claimed to be God. And so he can't just be a good teacher. He can't just be this, just be that, because he's either crazy and evil and manipulative, or he is who he says he is. And to those of you who are maybe on the edge of what you believe about Jesus, or or maybe even disagree with what I presented tonight, that's fine, let's talk about it. But, um, and I'm not bringing these things up, or this this C.S. Lewis quote to to stump you. Um, I'm not a person that likes I got you questions. I don't think those are very healthy or good for for, uh, conversation or, or, or even debate. But I'm bringing these things up because I truly believe that Jesus is the only way that we can reach God. I believe that he's made it clear, and I believe that that's the only way we can get to God. He's the only one who can provide a way of escape for our sins. I believe that C.S. Lewis is right when he says that he didn't leave his identity up for speculation. He didn't intend to do that. We either accept him as he says he is or a crazy, evil man. And so this is my application for tonight, and this this applies to everyone. Whether you've grown up in the church your entire life or or whether you're on the edge of your faith or whether you you just don't really even know who Jesus is and you're kind of like, well, I I don't know about this. Um, And so my application is a gospel reading challenge. How many of you guys like challenges? I kind of like challenges. I, sometimes I get into them, right? Like pull-up bars and stuff like that. <laughs> um, so it's a gospel reading challenge. And, and, and basically what it is is you, each week, and so if we start now, it's the beginning of October, you read through each gospel. So first week you read Matthew and then Mark and then Luke and then John. Um, and if you want to go really crazy with it, you can see how many times you can read you know, each one in each week, and that'd be pretty cool. Um, but it's just this gospel reading challenge. And, and the reason I think it would be awesome and, and, and is a good application for this sermon um, is that, you know, Jesus claimed, if you know me, you know God. And so when we read the words of Jesus, 
we get to know God better. And if maybe you're not sure about who Jesus is, maybe you're on the edge of your faith, you got to know what he said about himself before you make a decision about him. You know, whether you say he's crazy or whether you say he's God, I mean, you got to know about who he is and what he said. And so I think that this will do this for us. And by the way, guys, I, I almost always have a, a kind of a concrete, a, 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 an application, something to do based on, on the scripture that we have presented. And I want you guys to know that I, I do these things too, the applications that I, I present. And I sometimes don't like it. I sometimes don't like to do the, the, the applications. But if I'm going to tell you guys to do it, I'm going to do it too. And so I, I hope that this is something that, that you guys would like to do. Um, and so it, kind of in conclusion, I, I want to tell you guys who I believe Jesus is. I believe that Jesus is God and he is the savior of mankind. He is the one who has provided redemption for our sins through his sacrifice on the cross because our sins uh, give us a price to pay that we can't pay. And so through Jesus, who was a man, he could, uh, he could take the, 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 uh, the pain or he could take the punishment for our sins because he was a man. But he could also take the punishment of sins because he was God and he could rise again on, on the third day. And because of this, those of us who believe in him can have a resurrection with him. So I want to ask you guys, who is Jesus? You need to make a decision. And, and this is a decision that affects a lot more than our tailbones. This is, this is a big decision. Read through the Gospels and then you tell me, is he just a prophet? Is he a good teacher? Is he a demon? Is he just another controversial person to walk this earth? Is he fictional? Or is he who he claimed he was? God incarnate, the redeemer of the world. Who you say Jesus is is a matter of life and death. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we come to you now, Lord, and... We thank you, first off, for, for sending your son so that we uh, could have the ability to not be dead in our sins, to not be stuck in our sins. And God, we thank you for your sacrifice in that. God, I, I also thank you for your word, and, and I thank you for John who wrote these things down, and I thank you that, that he, uh, even in sometimes kind of a confusing passage like this, that he wrote down the things that we needed to know so that we can believe in you, so that we can believe in what you said. God, I pray that you would work in our hearts this month as we uh, embark on a, a gospel reading challenge. And, and wherever we are in our faith, God, I pray that you would, you would meet us there and that you would speak through your words and that you would speak through the words that you spoke on this earth a couple thousand years ago. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.